very grateful to Junaid and the organizing committee to, to have invited me to talk on neonatal bacterial meningitis and to give an update. I have no conflict of interest and nothing to declare. The objectives of my talk are to present to you a brief epidemiology, discuss risk factors and diagnosis, discuss the pathophysiology on how do bacteria enter the brain, how do they cause neuronal injury, then detail some principles and details of management, complications, outcome and conclusion. Meningitis is more common in the neonatal period than any other time of life. Though the overall incidence is low in high-income countries, both in the early onset sepsis and in the lower onset, low, late onset sepsis, but in lower and middle income countries, the incidence of meningitis is about five to nine times higher. This equates to about 153,000 neonatal deaths secondary to meningitis. That is 5% of all global neonatal mortality is due to meningitis. Neonatal meningitis remains an important cause of morbidity, such as deafness, blindness, cerebral palsy, seizures, hydrocephalus or cognitive impairment. And this morbidity has not changed either in the high income countries or in the low and middle income countries. And the reason for this is because the early diagnosis of meningitis remains a challenge and it is unclear how bacteria cross the blood brain barrier or how bacterial entry into the central nervous system results in inflammation, pleocytosis, disruption of the blood brain barrier and neuronal injury. William Canto, uh, 21 years ago in an editorial on pediatric and adolescent medicine asked a question, neonatal meningitis, do we have a clue? And today I will try 21 years later to try and answer some of these questions. But let's begin with the case. Abdul is a 1.6 kilogram male infant born to a 26 year old woman after 32 weeks gestation. Membranes were ruptured for more than 18 hours. His mother developed a temperature of 37.8 degrees centigrade, half an hour after initiation of epidural anesthesia. A vaginal culture done at 31 weeks gestation was positive for GBS. An intrapartum penicillin was administered six hours prior to delivery. Abdul was delivered by cesarean section. Abgar scores were good at nine and nine. He was admitted to the NICU because of prematurity, grunting and tachypnea. Chest X-ray showed fluid in the fissure, suggestive of a diagnosis of transient tachypnea of the newborn. However, due to the prolonged rupture of membranes, maternal fever, the team decides to do a septic screen, but debates whether to do a lumbar puncture or not. The debate is surrounded, uh, centered around the following, grunting, whether it is due to TTN or sepsis, second due to prolonged rupture of membranes, or is it secondary to intrapartum infection, i.e. chorioamnionitis, versus whether it's the maternal fever is secondary to epidural anesthesia, prematurity, or whether the GBS, what degree of protection did intrapartum prophylaxis provide uh, to Abdul having been given six hours prior to delivery. So what will be your management strategy? Initiate antibiotics following full septic screen, blood culture, full blood count and lumbar puncture? Or would you initiate antibiotics following blood culture and full blood count, but no lumbar puncture and do LP only if the blood culture was positive? There are no other signs and symptoms in, uh, in Abdul. But just like sepsis, the signs and symptoms of meningitis are very vague. The features which we commonly see in adults and uh, older children, body stiffness and neck stiffness is hardly ever seen in the newborn. But because of the risk factors of prematurity, prolonged rupture of membrane and maternal fever and tachypnea, which is also present in about 10% of babies with neonatal meningitis, the team, dis uh, team dis is debating whether to do a lumbar puncture or not. Another way of looking at uh, whether uh, an LP may be indicated or not is to look at the risk ratios. What are the risks of Abdul having a meningitis? 
Well, the risk factor, he is born at 32 weeks, that increases his chances by 4.6%. And I'll come back to DBS in a minute, but he, he was born after prolonged rupture of membranes longer than 18 hours, that increases his risk to seven point, by 7%. His weight is uh, 1.6, so it increases his risk by 8%. Similarly, male gender, 2%. And of course, intrapartum fever, prolonged rupture membrane, premature, any one of them, he was premature, that increases his risk by 10%. The GBS, it depends on how uh, florid the GBS uh, is in the, in the birth canal. And therefore, the ratio varies from 10% to 20, nearly 25%. So if we were to calculate the risk factors for Abdul having meningitis, they are fairly high, about 31 so I think it is fair to suggest that he should, he needs a lumbar puncture. But why this debate? Why this uncertainty? The reason is that in low, uh, in high income countries that the incidence of meningitis is low. The hardly any baby with meningitis is asymptomatic. Most babies are symptomatic. Uh, Abdul was not. Asymptomatic with risk factors are present has not been shown to be a major factor in doing lumbar puncture. And intrapartum prophylaxis he has received, and so there's some degree of protection. Obviously, nobody would do an uh, lumbar puncture if the baby was, un Abdul was unstable or had thrombocytopenia. But actually, if you look at what the evidence there is about lumbar puncture, Everybody agrees that lumbar puncture should always be done in late onset sepsis and in where blood culture is positive. In strongly suspected cases where the meningitis is strongly suspected, lumbar puncture should be included where the evidence is grade B. Lumbar puncture in early onset sepsis is the controversial issue and is the, uh, as it was in Abdul's case. In my personal opinion, it should be done. However, a very large survey, about 14,000 neonates done by Patrick in the United States showed that there was pronounced variation in the, L num in the way LP was performed. These findings indicated that there was no consensus. Some people did LPs in early, with early onset sepsis and many did not do LPs. And they suggested that this should be studied further. The other difficulty is, of course, what do you take as normal counts or normal values in the CSF? In a very recent paper, Thompson has shown that the medial cell count, median cell count is about three with a range of two to six, whereas many others previous studies have shown the cell count may be normal up to 20. Similarly, Thompson uh, has shown median protein of 57 milligram per deciliter with a range of 43 to 73, but previous studies have shown up to 104 milligram per deciliter of protein being normal. The glucose about 46, between 41 and 51, and that important is the glucose uh, CSF to serum ratio, and I'll come to that. Well, the team decided to do a lumbar puncture, Unfortunately, the CSF was blood stained, white cell count was 20, neutrophils 40%, protein 100 milligram per deciliter, glucose 21.6 milligram, serum uh, glucose was 50.4, but no organism C. So, does Abdul have meningitis? Yes, no, or don't know. One just matter of di digress in digression here, People, a number of colleagues I have known uh, do adjustment ca calculations when there is a blood stain CSF. They adjust the CSF white blood cell count uh, and red cell count ratios. But as Rachel Greenberg, Lyons and ourselves have shown very clearly that if you do any of these calculations, whether you do 500 to 1, 1,000 to 1, or use any other ratio, the sensitivity and specificity of such counts is very, very low. And therefore, I, I personally, I think it's a totally waste of time trying to calculate these ratios. So the current position about lumbar puncture is this. The protein concentration above 150 or 180 uh, indicate poor prognosis. Glucose concentration should be 70% to 80% of serum levels. And if you want a ratio, it should be more than 
The blood culture actually is only positive in about 38% of cases with meningitis. But the more important uh, thing which I want you to take home is that to nearly a quarter of neonates, particularly pre neonates with meningitis, have normal CSF blood count, normal glucose, and normal uh, uh, protein levels. The cell count is often uh, used as a basic gold standard, and Richard Froling, who spoke earlier has shown that if there are 15 cells in the CSF, it should probably be considered suspect. And if there are more than 20 cells, it should be considered elevated. Right? So now Abdul has remained asymptomatic, but he's hemodynamically unstable. Cultures are still pending. What other tests may be of value in the diagnosis of bacterial meningitis? There's a large number of tests which have been done and shown to be of some use. But what I do want to point out is one simple test, which we all, nearly all of us have facilities to do, but don't do it, is the CSF lactate. It has a high sensitivity of between 88 to 96 percent and a very high positive specificity of 98 to 100 percent. If I was to choose what test I would do on a CSF, I would certainly do a white count, I'd do protein, I'd do a CSF blood glucose ratio, I'd do a CSF CRP or, or a lactate. If I was considering GBS, I would do GBS antigen. If my CSF was blood stained, I would do a multiplex PCR because that would give me high degree of specificity to diagnose meningitis. More Advanced units and um, units with a lot of funding are doing so-called omics studies, studying genomics and cytokine arrays, proteinomics and metabolomics. But I think even in those, if you read all the literature, the three tests which have been shown to be of great value is one glial fibrillin acid protein, C3, because C3, if it is low, it suggests poor prognosis. But once again, lactate has been highlighted as a very good marker of meningitis. If you do an ultrasound in meningitis earlier on, you will might find edema, later meningeal thickening, subdural effusion, and much later, you would get ventricular dilatation with debris collection and development of hydrocephalus, and much, much later, liquefaction of the cere uh, cerebral cortex. If you uh, add Doppler to it, in initially, you will see increased meningeal blood flow, you might see subdural effusion, and then late, in, in late stages, you will see liquefaction. MRI and CT are hardly ever needed. If, if uh, it is needed, I would prefer to do an MRI rather than a CT because of radiation. Obviously, microbiology is extremely important, but microbiology and the pathogens differ from country to country, and in fact, from unit to unit. In, in the Western world, GPS and E. coli are the most common organisms. In Africa and Asia, it is again G, uh, E. coli, mainly with polysaccharide K1 capsule uh, uh, or Klebsiella. And I recently found a paper from UAE, which was talking about neonatal sepsis, not particularly meningitis, but interestingly, they also see more E. coli and Klebsiella. Now, having made the diagnosis of meningitis, uh, once we need to understand why meningitis develops, it needs bacterial host interactions at seven stages. So initially, there should be colonization, invasion, attachment, inflammation and replication, evasion, survival and, pro uh, and progression of infection, brain injury and progression of inflammation. And I'll discuss each one of them. Colonization. Bacteria ascending from maternal birth canal colonize the skin, there's a pharynx and other parts of the infant, and, and particularly if there is uh, intra-amniotic infection, i.e. chorioamnionitis, then you would get a fair amount of pathogen entering the amniotic fluid. And, uh, and, and so most of the infection a, a newborn gets in the early onset is ascending infection. Very, very rarely uh, it, it is from the environment within the first 72 hours but um, uh, certainly late in late onset sepsis, i.e. after 72 hours, it is the environment which is mainly responsible for the path pathogens. What about invasion? The bacteria 
enters the, uh, uh, penetrates the mucosal barrier, whether it be in the bronchial tissue, in the lungs, in the blood vessels, or in the gut. And, and, and what happens is when we put a baby and put an endotracheal tube, we damage the mucosa, and that gives the chance of bacteria to enter the mucosa and enter into circulation. When we put picket lines, vini puncture, or even simple tape, and when we take the tape off, the first epidermal layer of the skin peels off, and that gives an opportunity for organisms to enter. But the most important way the bacteria enter into this circulation is from the gut, where they they pass through uh, through the uh, tight junctions which are slightly looser in the newborn and when if they have been stressed or hypoxic then th these these tight junctions are even much looser and so it makes easier for the bacteria to enter the vascular subepithelium and this is the key step in pathogenesis of uh, meningitis once the bacteria have entered in the blood vessels. Bacteria need to cross two structural and functional barriers to reach the CNS, the blood-brain barrier, the blood-CSF barrier. And these barriers are different. They are not the same. For example, the blood-brain barrier, the endothelial cells are joined with tight junctions. These endothelial cells have tight junctions that regulate the flow of solutes and that do not allow the bacteria to enter. They also are covered and insheeted with a basement membrane. Once again, a secondary protection of not allowing bacteria to enter the uh, blood vessels. And last but not least, the uh, astrocytes have these end or foot processes which also surround the, uh, the, the blood vessels. Thus, it is very difficult for bacteria to enter through the blood-brain barrier. However, for the blood CSF barrier, the story is quite different. Let's just compare the adult, why they don't get so much meningitis compared to the neonate. In the adult, the, the cells, the endothelial cells in the blood vessels uh, and in the gut mucosa or the lung mucosa are tightly fixed with tight uh, uh, junctions, Very, uh, absolutely tight junctions, secondary proteins, are, and there is also adherent jun uh, adherence which stick these two cells together and thus do not allow the bacteria to cross in between the cells. However, in the newborn and particularly in the preterm, these tight junctions are loose, the tight junctions are weak, and the adherent uh, junction proteins that which make these cells stick together are also loose, thus allowing the bacteria from the gut to easily enter in, uh, into the blood vessels. And this is where in the choroid plexus, exactly the same thing happens. The tight junctions are very loose and the uh, uh, the epithelial and the cells of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, choroid plexus are uh, fenestrated, and that's allowing the bacteria to enter the brain and the CSF. How do bacteria then enter, other than and entering through uh, once they have? escaped into the uh, blood vessels. They have three mechanisms which we, by which they enter into the brain and the CSF, for, which is called transcellular. That means they enter and break the um, cytoskeleton of the cell. Once they are in the cell, they surround themselves with a capsule so that they are not attacked by the cytoplasm of the endothelial cell. And this then, on this, as the cell uh, allows, uh, moves, the, the bacteria moves along with the cell. The paracellular is with, through the tight, tight junctions. The bacteria move, the, if the junctions are not tight, they escape in between. And here you can see the bacteria crossing the, in, where the junctions are not very tight. But the most interesting and important factor is the Trojan horse phenomena where the bacteria enter into a white cell or a macrophage, remain there and stick to them. And as the white cell and the macrophage enters the circulation, enters the many, uh, CSF, they uh, are uh, carried along with it. Here's an E. coli on a phagocytic uh, white blood cells sticking in. As the phagocyte moves into the uh, cerebral circulation, the bacteria will move in. So once 
the bacteria have entered the CNS, they cause inflammation and have to, have to multiply. What did they do? They create oxidative stress and uh, formation of free radicals, which go on to cause, uh, kill the neuronal cells, secondary to oxidative stress. They also cause mitochondrial failure and the release of, uh, of metalloproteinases and other toxic fragments, which uh, cause autophagocytosis and cell death. They increase cell death by apoptosis, necrosis and preaptosis. And what is more important is that they set up a vicious cycle of inflammation by stimulating and activating the astrocyte and the microglia, which release chemokines, cytokines, and this circle keeps going around, to, it causes more break in the blood-brain barrier, it, it allows more cells to, uh, to come in uh, to the CNS. Once it is in the CNS and the cells are also uh, in the CNS, they alter the cerebral blood flow by causing edema, spasm and thrombosis, and they increase neuronal cell death due to influx of sodium and calcium into the cells activated astrocytes and macrophages directly damage the white matter and neurons, release cytokines, act on the microglia and astrocytes, transforming them into anti uh, antigen-presenting cells capable of displacing myelin uh, fragments from normal myelin. And these activated macrophages strip the myelin, strip the myelin here uh, from axons affecting normal transmission of nerve impulses, causing diverse motor, motor symptoms like seizures and sensory and autonomic symptoms, which we see in meningitis. But once these bacteria are doing all that, they have to be, they have to survive and they, uh, because they are being attacked by the uh, host defense system. But what, as I've shown you, uh, organisms are very clever, E. coli forming a capsule, thus it, ca it cannot be recognized by the toll-like receptors, so it cannot be attacked. The other is, of course, that the, there is in the brain and in the CNS, there's localized areas of, it is a localized area of immune deficiency because there is very little as secretory IgA and IgG to form antibodies and to fight these bacteria. The other, and the only way the new, newborn can fight uh, the men, in, men, uh, infection in the meninges is uh, through deposition of C3B uh, surf, uh, on the surface of bacteria which promotes phagocytosis and clearance of bacteria. But of course, the bacteria being very clever, particularly GBS and E. coli, they inhibit the C3 as well. So they actually are much better in uh, surviving than, our, uh, than the immune defense system of the newborn. Progression of inflammation, it's a vicious cycle, as I've shown you, because of the oxidative stress, because of mitochondrial uh, damage, and because of the activation of astrocytes and microglia, which keep on producing more chemokines, cytokines, and breaking the blood-brain barrier. So in summary, uh, the pathogenesis is bacterial invasion, release of toxins, activation of homopoietic cells, bacterial attachment, and uh, to white cells and endothelium, transendothelial migration of activated cells, crossing the blood brain and the blood CSF barrier, release of pro inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, activation of astrocytes and macrophages, which further release cytokines, metaproteinases, hypo cause hypoxia, and increase in lactate and, and cell destruction. And this vicious cycle goes round and round and, uh, and is responsible for brain damage. So to answer Dr. Cantor's question, yes, we are getting closer to understanding the pathogenesis of neonatal meningitis a little better, but are we any better at managing neonatal meningitis? Our main objective in the management of meningitis are to reduce the source of bacterial entry into the CSF, kill the organism, reduce or neutralize, eliminate bacterial toxins, and boost the host defenses if we can, and prevent neuronal and white matter damage. Reducing the source of entry, of course, is good hand hygiene, good prevent, uh, preventive me uh, medicine, prevent prematurity or prolonged rupture of membranes, intrapartum prophylaxis, and 
Some people have shown anti uh, TNF alpha or one IL, uh, interleukin one beta may be helpful in preventing infection. We have shown uh, that IgM at given early is also preventive uh, in preventing sepsis and in meningitis. Our immediate goal for treatment is to, of course, to sterilize the CSF as quickly as possible, prevent progression of infection, prevent neuronal damage if possible. So the main tool which we have, or the main weapon which we have are antibiotics, and we, but we have to choose the antibiotics very carefully. We need to choose bactericidal antibiotics. We need to choose antibiotics which achieve high concentration in CSF. And here you can see the CSF serum ratio of antibiotics. And the best we can get is gentamicin, cefotaxin, cephalosporins, and of course, cholestin. But we don't really use that. Our base is based on ampicillin, cephalosporin, and gentamicin glycoside. In meningitis, the CSF pH changes and that reduces the effectiveness of aminoglycosides and that, and that is the reason you need to increase the dose of aminoglycosides to achieve good CSF uh, uh, levels. Protein-bound antibiotics like cephalosporins also uh, have diminished activity but still maintain a fairly amount, fairly good amount in the CSF. Bacteria, if they grow slowly, then the beta lactam, uh, lactams uh, are less effective. And some of the antibiotics are metabolized in the CSF, like amipenems and things, or the hydrophilic antibiotics like vancomycin. And this is the reason why we all differ in what antibiotic we choose. But for most purposes, I think ampicillin, uh, ampicillin cephalosporin, and gentamicin are the drugs of choice. The current consensus, uh, if there is any, is that empiric re regimen of penicillin and cefotaxin or a combination of penicillin, e.g. ampicillin and aminoglycoside is recommended for initial empiric therapy, but the level of evidence is only C. Gram-negative meningitis should be treated for at least 14 to 21 days, class of evidence B and C. We use cefotaxin and aminoglycoside. Gram-positive infection should be treated for at least 14 days, class C evidence. Listeria you treat with ampicillin, and penicillin is equally effective. Cogl is negative, vancomycin, ESBL, meropenem. We very rarely have used, there have been two papers on the use of cholestin in, 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 given intraventricularly uh, due to in, in the cases of ventriculitis secondary to meningitis. There is another debate in, in, the, in the management of uh, meningitis as whether to do a repeat lumbar puncture or not. Again, coming back to Rachel Greenberg's paper, she has shown that the time taken for CSF culture to become negative is a median of four, varies from two to seven days. The time taken for CSF protein to normalize is much later, eight days and the range is between five and 10 days. Time taken for glucose to normalize is early within 48 hours, range one to three days. But the time taken for white cell count to normalize in the CSF takes a much longer period for um, in the range is six to 30 days. So there is very little evidence to suggest that a repeat LP is, is necessary, unless of course the baby is not improving or you're suspecting uh, some other pathogen like fungal, infect, fungal meningitis. Most neonates with meningitis develop cerebral edema, which is, which is also resogenic, it is also cytotoxic, it is osmotic and interstitial because of entry of sodium and water leads to immediate cell death and swelling and lysis and entry of calcium into the cell increases apoptosis. So cerebral edema is, dang is dangerous, in, but it occurs in all, nearly all babies with meningitis. The question is whether when there is evidence of cerebral edema, should you restrict fluid or not? Uh, the evidence there is suggests that there is no uh, uh, advantage in restricting fluid, but certainly one should not be very liberal. If you restrict fluid, you will get hypoglycemia, more acute kidney injury, more polycythemia, more weight loss, and more shock. Uh, in my own practice, I don't restrict fluid. I give normal fluid, but I do not, uh, I'm not very generous with fluid, and I don't go overboard. There, uh, you need to correct uh, uh, inappropriate ADH secretion. Dexamethasone has no role, neither has mannitol or glycerol. 
What about preventing neuronal injury? Well, there is very little evidence to suggest any of the antitoxins, free radical inhibitors, steroids, and the thelium and, and the thelium antagonists, whether they, wo they work or not, there's very little evidence that, that they work. Anti-TNF is harmful. We need to, some, our work has shown that reset the cytokine balance, modulate inflammatory coagulation through IgM. That is, as I showed you, the um, uh, meta-analysis, you, you need about one, uh, seven infants to get one benefit. More recent uh, research work is on use of brain-derived neurotropic factors or mesenchymal stem cell, which prevents the uh, uh, release of uh, oxidative stress factors and uh, also uh, allows regeneration uh, of neuronal cells. So that is a, at the moment uh, experimental, but that's where the, uh, I think the answers would lie. Of course, we all know complications like seizures occur, and if they last for more than 72 hours, there's a very high chance of mor uh, mor uh, morbidity and severe disability. And babies may develop hydrocephalus or brain abscesses. The outcome uh, in less than five year old, uh, in uh, uh, under fives, and followed in low and middle income countries, as I told you, mortality is high, but there is very high level of 60 to 80 percent have developmental delay or motor deficit hearing impairment, epilepsy or vision impairment. But the numbers are very uh, similar in the developed world where there is a high level of neuromotor uh, disability about 40 percent and seizures about 20 percent uh, and learning difficulties about 30 uh, percent in, uh, in the high income countries. I started with uh, epidemiology and uh, gave you global figures. Global figures are there are about 300,000 cases of meningitis, uh, of which 27,000 will end up with neurodisability, and I told you 150,000 uh, will die. Of course, we can prevent with early, if we had the opportunity to diagnose meningitis early give GBS prophylaxis where GBS is common. And of course, there are vaccines which we should routinely be using and giving to the babies. So if I'd like to conclude here, the neonatal meningitis remains a devastating disease, incidence and treatment of which has not significantly changed in the past 30 years. Mortality has fallen currently about 6.6% .6 in developed and 50 to 60% in the developing world. Morbidity has not changed. It remains between 65 to 80%. The improvements in outcome will result from interventions to decrease the incidence of early onset bacterial sepsis, rapid identification of affected infants, better understanding of the mechanism responsible for brain injury, concomitant use of antibiotics and neuroprotective agents. Uh, thank you for your attention. These are my references. I'm quite happy to answer any questions.